Class, good morning again. It's good to be with you as we continue our series study uh, based on the book, Faith is for Weak People, written by Ray Comfort. We, we are closely and quickly coming to the end of our series of topics uh, that are based out of the table of contents of Ray's book. And uh, we've got one today that we're going to kind of go back and revisit from last week. Um, the question from last week was kind of a question sandwiched in between a couple of statements. Uh, maybe a hint or an air of condescension, which might make things seem a bit personal, and we certainly don't want to allow things to affect us that way. But um, just as kind of a continuation of where we left off last week, in order that we not make one video uh, entirely too long, I uh, thought we would come back today and look at our question from last week in a bit of a different light. Uh, an opportunity maybe to further our discussion within someone who has uh, become humbled a bit in their uh, demeanor in the course of our conversation with them or someone who came to us, uh, God sending them our way or he placing us in their path as a genuine truth seeker. So uh, hey, let's pray together and we'll get started, okay? Father in heaven, thank you for uh, just gracing us with your sweet presence today. Thank you for the beautiful day you've provided, and we certainly thank you most of all for providing us Jesus Christ, and Father, for your precious word of which you, Spirit of Truth, Holy Spirit, can take and apply in our life in such a way that we can uh, be used of you to uh, apply truth and impart truth into the lives of others. Again, as we have said so many times, keep us focused on what's most important here. You, your word, and the heart for lost people. Not knowing all the answers, not knowing how to debate, but uh, the heart for lost people. Keep us centered upon you and others, certainly more than us. That's our prayer. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, faith is for weak people. Ray Comfort's book, we have covered almost the entire table of contents, and I think today might be the other exception. I think maybe there was one before where we actually took an extra week's study to kind of explore the question. don't want to talk this to death, so let's go ahead and, uh, and kind of look. Um, this was our question from last week. Seeing is believing statement, okay, kind of a defined statement. Here's the question, why do I need faith? And here's why they ask the question that they ask. Faith is for weak people. I, 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 would, uh, I would go ahead and insert something that we'll do our best to come back to a little bit later on. There's a difference between being weak and being meek. And we want to go ahead and put that out there now. And I want to be accountable to coming back to that a little bit later on, but we'll We'll use this as uh, the second part of our study today. And if folks who uh, offer the question between the two statements uh, is a bit uh, more feeling full of themselves, if you want to call it that, if they're feeling a little more brash and a little more confident in, in, uh, in offering what they believe to be true and how they feel, they might even go as far as maybe to back up the question between the two statements with something kind of like this. This not only seems foolish, okay, uh, you know, weak people, weak-minded people, uh, this not only seems foolish, again, uh, God's choosing the foolish things of this world. Uh, a, a message uh, through the preaching of foolishness to people who don't know Christ uh, would seem foolish to them, certainly. This not only seems foolish, it, it sounds childish. Okay, uh, something worth exploring. Holy Spirit will take us there, okay? So, from the Christ follower back to the skeptic, uh, or even, again, a, a genuine truth seeker can sometimes portray themselves in one manner to kind of test the water with us in order that they can come around to the conclusion that, uh, okay, apparently not only do they believe what they're telling me to be true, but there's a sense of power under control here, meekness, poise, kind of a sports term that you may have heard before. 
uh, where, the, where the game, if we're using an athletic type metaphor or illustration, doesn't get too big for us, where the circumstances of life don't seem to get too big in order that they alter our demeanor and our conversation. So, you know, we can come back around behind that and, and kind of quickly make a, an assertion here, a, a statement. Listen, faith is not childish, but it is childlike. Now that might get some wheels turning a bit, and we certainly hope that it will. And, and we might even alter the title a little bit, and I think Ray Comfort would allow us a little, uh, 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 provide us a little grace here. Uh, hey, we might even come on the heels of that and say, you know, actually faith is for childlike people. Now, you need to be prepared to take it somewhere from there. And God's Word, again, with the leading of Holy Spirit, our spirit of truth, uh, he can take us where he wants us to go and where he wants to lead them to. Again, Holy Spirit does what he testifies to a person, about a person, Jesus Christ. He's also there to bring to our remembrance the, the things that Jesus said, and we have the Bible as a collection of those things. Old Testament pointing toward the coming of Messiah Jesus, and then New Testament he arrives. He, he pays for our sin on the cross. Uh, the good news of the gospel is proclaimed and then furthered on through the lives of the disciples and, and the writers like Paul. So childlike people, hey, we hope that gets some spiritual wheels turning. In fact, we, we, we could even maybe coin something here that before one can enter God's kingdom, before one can claim with affirmation, assurance, and confidence that heaven will be their home one day, before we can ever become a Christian, listen, we've got to essentially stoop down, lower ourselves, be humble, be humbled, however you want to look at that, uh, before entering, we need to stoop. Now, that may be a little bit more than a person who doesn't know Christ can process at that particular time, but I think you'll get the idea as we continue to move forward. A beautiful passage of Scripture, as they all are, is out of Matthew 18. In my study Bible, which is a MacArthur, uh, we have the heading here of these particular verses of Scripture, Instruction About Humility. In other words, uh, being humble is seeing ourselves as God sees us. Uh, he knows who we truly are. And, and when we understand how totally dependent we are upon him for the help that we need in life, we'll see ourselves in, in a more appropriate light. Uh, pride actually being the antithesis of humility, uh, uh, an overinflated, inappropriate uh, assessment of oneself. But uh, this is what Matthew writes in chapter 18, starting in verse 1. We'll key on a few verses here in just a moment. But it says this, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This particular matter about being great in the kingdom uh, was not really a, a noble question. It, it came out of a sense of pride, if you want to call it that. There was actually, I guess you could say, maybe a little bit of a competition within the group of disciples at that particular time. Some felt like they were entitled to some place, uh, a position of authority in heaven. And um, so this became uh, 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 maybe a contentious back and forth. Jesus could sense this, and I think uh, out of that understood fully, they're just not quite getting not only what I'm saying, but why? But in verse 2 of Matthew 18, he says, Then Jesus called a little child to himself, to him. And he set the child in the midst of him and said, As surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Now, when you look at the earthly life and the ministry of Jesus, 
and you, you see how Jesus reacted when children were nearby, it might not be a stretch of spiritual truth to say that uh, maybe Jesus esteemed children as much or maybe more than any demographic, any group of people that we know of. I've got this in my spiritual mind and imagination that uh, anywhere that Jesus might have been, I don't think children were, were far away. Uh, I feel like he was just like, a, he, he, there was a magnetism about Jesus and children. I think wherever Jesus might have been, if he was, in, was inside of children, I, I believe they wanted to make their way over to him. I think there was something about the youthful exuberance of a child, their energy and their enthusiasm, their carefree nature that Jesus was drawn to as well. And he's using this illustration, this out of the Christian Standard Bible, I just read out of the New King James, that, uh, you know, he had that child come over and stand in the midst of them. And, and again, a bit of a different translation, you know, Jesus said, truly, I, I tell you, unless you turn, unless you repent and you become like children, you're never, ever going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That had to be a curious thing for Jesus to say. So understanding the custom of the day, if you want to look at some historical content, it was quite common, uh, Jewish custom, that parents would bring their children of various ages to the rabbi or to the teacher in order that he could extend to them some sort of a blessing. So you know, this particular setting, uh, not anything uncommon. We also know that the disciples had this feeling about them that, uh, you know, anytime that Jesus maybe had some time to himself, you know, they, they almost would take it upon themselves to kind of protect that time, if you want to call it that. Uh, we remember reading where they kind of discouraged children from coming and uh, because they felt like maybe he had been so extended in offering himself to the people. You know, why bother with these little children? Jesus saw it. Uh, anything but that and how thankful we are that in any situation Jesus was willing to take time and to teach and that's exactly what he did here. But when we think about children and the nature of children as to how that can fit within this teachable moment for Jesus and how this can be imparted to us and how this can work into and out of our hearts, minds, and mouths regarding spiritual conversation. Think about kids for just a moment. They're, they're just so carefree. They just move around and maneuver, even certainly through a fallen world, with, with very little worry, it seems, about them at all. Uh, give, give them very little, okay, in their hand. They, they can take very little, and, and they can fill up a day with it. I, I remember both of our boys when they were young, could find themselves preoccupying their time with the least of things. And, and they could not only, I guess you could say, spend a, a few minutes, my goodness, even a few hours, an hour or two or so, just get, getting the most out of something that seemed to be very insignificant. That's the beauty of, uh, of the nature of, of a child. And, uh, but uh, children are also, you know, that. They're simple. Uh, they see life very uncomplicated, and uh, and they're also helpless. They're 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 trusting because they're truly dependent on someone else who has resources to help take care of them. I guess we could put it like this: uh, Children don't have much at all to bring to the table. They're not the income provider. And because they come into this world, you know, their parents see them and they adore them and they also understand the security there within the home and the family. So they have a trusting dependence on someone else to provide for them what they're going to need. And they also really have nothing uh, with regard to achievement or accomplishment to offer or commend themselves with. Now, uh, uh, again, we're thinking about the nature of children as it can fit into this story because Jesus is wanting to make a point. Uh, they're also children, trusting of someone else by, by faith. 
to see them through, to keep the promises made for them. And because they really don't have a lot of worldly care and concern because they've not been in this fallen world as long as adults have. Some have said it like this, they've not been in the world long enough to be stained by it. I, I like that. Uh, but because they've really not uh, acquired a lot of the burden of this world, they, they worry less. And because they really worry less, they really have fewer questions to offer. They're, they're just not critical or, or cynical at that age. They're just carefree, but they're dependent and they're trusting in someone else to take total care of them. Now, think about children. Think about the kingdom of God. Think about saving faith. Think about the Holy Spirit taking the word of God and leading someone who doesn't know Christ personally to the knowledge and the realization they are hopelessly lost in a condition, sin, we're all born into it, Romans 3, 23, that if they die in that condition, heaven will not be their home. They'll be eternally separated from God. And when Holy Spirit makes this clear to them and they understand, again, like a child, they don't have anything to bring to the table. God is extending them something really, really good, unimaginably good, grace that they don't deserve. He's also not dealing with them as they so rightly deserve. That's mercy, grace and mercy flowing out of his love for them. They're, they're not able to, to help themselves out of this situation. They understand that. They're humbled by that. And when they think about the fact that God provided the means and Jesus did the work, this is actually very simple. God did not intend to make this, as we've said, rocket science, okay? Hard to understand. Some people look at the simplicity of the good news of the gospel and they try to use that as an excuse to keep God at an arm's length. Uh, folks will make any number of excuses to keep from turning their heart and life over to Christ. So, you know, we, we think about the nature of children and we think about entering the kingdom like a child and we can begin to see the point that Jesus is trying to make here. Again, it's not about being childish. It's not about being weak in the way that we would see weak as being incapable. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's childlike faith. And when you think about exercising, saving faith, and turning your heart and life over to Christ, a person, a fair question might be uh, to the skeptic, is there anything any more bold and courageous than this? Because true trusting and relinquishing our life and turning it over to someone else it is bold. Uh, but that's what is required. We understand with the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that we, we can't save ourselves. And from that point on, and I, I think a lot of folks when they're still lost are trying to process this in a way that they really can't understand that when we trust our life to Christ, He comes to live in us. His intent is to, is to help us moment to moment, day to day, to live the life for Christ that we could not do on our own, couldn't accomplish it. Folks who are lost are still looking through the wrong lens, through using the wrong perspective. And that's why we've got to be very careful when we're trying to impart truth to someone who doesn't know Christ. We don't want to get hung up on how it feels to be a Christian because that can be very misleading. God will not deal with everyone exactly the same. But the nature of, of children, of faith like a child, stooping down, becoming childlike in order to enter the kingdom. Jesus is using this to drive home a very powerful point. Why is this important? Because the nature of adults can sometimes be anything like being childlike. Uh, adults can be childish, certainly, if we don't get our own way. Uh, you know, we, we can appear to act like a child would sometimes very immature, again, even demanding our own way. Uh, if, if things don't work out the way we would desire them to, listen, we can start to form some critical questions. People who are struggling uh, with or seriously considering a life as a Christ follower will focus more before they turn their heart and life over to Christ on what will it be that I'll have to give up 
in this process. It almost lends itself to the realization that they're more enamored with the things of this world and the life they're living more than turning their heart and life over to some who can provide them hope, peace, and a flavor uh, and an excitement quality of life that they could not enjoy apart from Christ. When I say excitement, I'm here to say this, there's no life like living for Christ. And in a fallen world, when I say exciting, that doesn't mean trouble free. That doesn't mean the road is always going to be paved and smooth. Because in a fallen world, we're going to encounter hardships, challenges, difficulties, but we have the help, we have the hope to see us through in and with Christ that someone who doesn't know Him can't experience. It can be a struggle without Him. So, and another thing about the nature of adults, as time goes on, time can anesthetize. What do you mean, Jeff, by that? Well, the longer people live, uh, the more they tend to feel like, well, I've got more time to consider this. I've got more time to make this decision. I've got more time to live as a Christian. However they want to say this or process it, people can be lulled into a false sense of security if they're not careful. Uh, when the Holy Spirit is dealing, <laughs> that's the time to turn everything over to Him. And we also have been told through studies in the past that it is more likely for those who are younger to be willing to turn their heart and life over to Christ than it is as they get older. Those who, who do surveys and who establishes uh, percentages of people who trust Christ at certain points and ages, uh, the, the numbers go down significantly as people get older. So there is something to this childlike faith in entering the kingdom. So we're, we're called to come as a child. But when you think about what we're told in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, listen, God's ways and thoughts are unimaginably, infinitely higher than ours. So even though this is childlike faith, listen, we are being called to a much higher place. This doesn't make us God. It doesn't make us a God. But what this enables us to do after we turn our heart and life over to Christ is we receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God that we can rely upon to help us know how to navigate and live in a fallen world. We can understand better the way God would want us to think and how He would want us to act and react as life plays out here in this world upon which the curse of sin resides. So hey, even though we come as a child, listen, with Christ, in Christ, we're called to a much higher place. Uh, we're also alluding again to the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit referred to as Spirit of Truth. It takes the Word of God, the truth of God, makes it palatable, makes it relevant, enables the child of God to take the Word and stick it to life. One of the great benefits of being a Christian uh, maybe the greatest benefit is having the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, God, Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And again, His purpose is to testify about the person of Jesus Christ. So from Isaiah 55, we're being called from a place to a person. Holy Spirit can make that uh, possible. And listen, before they're willing to step out in saving faith. Remember, they're still thinking like a lost person. Uh, once they're willing to turn everything over to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to reside within and with. My goodness, their perspective, their drive, their passion, their way of thinking will change along with that, and they can continue to grow with Christ day to day to day. And out of our personal testimony, as we go through life, uh, when these opportunities to witness come up, we can be out of being affirmed in our own personal experience. And listen, we're not talking about we're we're not talking about trying to describe a feeling here. We're just trying through our confident hope and expectation 
the confidence that we have that Holy Spirit is there with us and directing us, the power that we can receive to, to do life in Christ. We're promised that we will receive everything we need to live a life in Christ Jesus. That's a promise right out of the Word. And listen, while we were on it very quickly, isn't it wonderful to know that in the Word of God, under the power of God, we not only have promises that are established for us, but we have Holy Spirit there to help keep those promises within us. In other words, listen, God's never broken His Word or a promise. And Holy Spirit is there to help us live out of that uh, assurance that every promise that's ever been make, made toward us and for us will be kept and that we have the power to live in faith, uh, a, a consistent, faithful, and obedient life in Christ. We can look at those who are considering Christ as their Savior and Lord. Listen, we can, we can look at them and say, listen, ju just trust Him. Taste and see that He's good. Why? Because the psalmist wrote this in chapter 34, verse 8. He said, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. They can imagine the, the, the quality of life that they can appreciate and enjoy. Walking in newness of life. It, there's no life like it. No life like it. So again, as we're getting ready to wrap this up, there's a difference between being meek and weak. Holy Spirit inside of us enables us to balance out in life. Listen, life without Christ can be, it, it can be peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Holy Spirit's there inside of the Christian. Listen, we see this written out for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul wrote this, you know, that even though we're going to be pressed on every side, we'll not be crushed. Holy Spirit is there to be our balance so that the peaks and the valleys are not quite as sharp up and down. He is that balance for us. He is the spirit within us that enables us to remain poised because there's a power inside of us that operates under God's control. And again, our opportunity to uh, be an influence into the lives of others that there's really only one life to be lived and that is in and with Jesus Christ. So, I mean, weak, weak people, weak-minded people. Does that sound childish? Uh, listen, we can beg to differ very tactfully. Uh, we can do this, you know, with, with poise and meekness. Listen, it's not childish. It's childlike faith. And for one to be able to enter God's kingdom, he's going to have to be willing to enter like a child, as if he were kind of lowering himself, humbling himself, stooping down. Think about that maybe if you have an opportunity to share this in conversation with someone, a skeptic, a cynic, a genuine truth seeker. Uh, hey, a lot uh, to be excited about and uh, much to process. But, uh, hey, you have help from on high. Father, we thank you again for uh, just providing for our every need, uh, providing us a presence, an influence, a testimony, your personality, your fruit, that you can reach out of our lives and, and, and touch the lives of others. Use us, Father. As we've asked before, may our lights shine brightly for you. May others see and sense you in us and no one or nothing less. That's our prayer. And we ask all this in the name above every name, Jesus Christ. Thank you once again for the cross and the empty tomb. In Jesus' name, amen.